Father, close our eyes as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time. We thank you, Lord, because anytime you're speaking to us, power will come with that word. Authority will come with that word. And the word will be a blessing to every one of us in Jesus' name. I pray at this time you lift your people up. And you lift up to greater heights and greater possibilities in our ministries in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. You can be seated. We're going on in a series on leadership. And there is something in leadership that is so very important. If we're going to actually be the leader that will succeed. And here we are today. We're going to succeed in Jesus' name. Amen. What are we talking about? What is it that makes a leader to succeed? And if there is one thing I can tell you that makes a leader to succeed is captured and comprehended in this word vision. Vision. Now when I say vision, depending on where you are coming from, you can begin to think of vision in another way. But I'm talking of vision in a particular way this afternoon. Vision. What do you see? What vision do you see of the Almighty God? When you see a vision of God, your life will never be the same again. That was made a difference between the life of Moses at 40 and, in, and Moses at 80. Moses saw a vision of God and it was never the same anymore. That's why he ministered and he lived and he did everything as seeing him who is invisible. That's what makes the difference between Saul of Tarsus and Paul, the apostle. The same person, the same personality. Saul on this side had not seen a vision. And then a line came in his life. A point came in his life. He saw a vision. And then the vision transformed him to become Paul, the apostle. And it is that vision that drove him. It is that vision that propelled him. It is that vision that made him the apostle, the man that he became. When looking at Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1 in verse 13. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? That's vision. What seest thou? I present a man before you. His name is Moses. And as I present him before you, I ask you the question, What seest thou? And then you might say, I see a fugitive. I see a runaway man. I see an old man. I see an unaccomplished dream. I see a man at 80, a failure. That's what you see. That's vision. What do you see, Moses, about yourself? I see a stammerer. I see somebody that cannot do anything. I see an unqualified and unacceptable person who cannot achieve. But I look at the same Moses. I say, Almighty God, this man is 80 years of age already. Oh Lord, what do you see in this man? I see a champion. I see a deliverer. I see an achiever. I see a miracle worker. I see a man with the rod of God in his hand, and I see a man going down to Egypt to deliver a great and mighty nation. You see, who you see and what you see will determine what you do in life. I may be presenting some members of your church to you, and this member of your church is Moses. The side you see about Moses will determine how much you are going to use him. I present another man to you. His name is David. Here comes David. And David came to the battlefield. He was born for such a time as this. I am born for a challenge. 
I am born for a time of difficulty. And here comes David. Eliab, what do you see? Who do you see? I see a young man who is proud. I see a man who should be on the field watching over the sheep. What are you doing here, David? This is not a place for you. That's what his senior brother saw. What does your senior brother, your senior sister, what does he see about you? What does your husband see about you? What does your wife see about you? And then David said, Eliab, senior brother, why are you talking to me like that? You have a short-sighted vision. You look at me and you do not see anointing. And yet I was anointed in chapter 16. This is chapter 17. How is it, Eliab? Every time you look at me, you never see any other thing than what you have always seen when I was a little baby. I don't see what you see, Eliab. I see anointing upon me. Get out of my way. I'm going to the king. And then he comes to Saul. And as he comes to Saul, and then Saul, what do you see? I see a youth who wants to endanger his life. I see a reckless youth who wants to do the impossible, the incredible, the unbelievable. You cannot. And David said, I'm not going to allow your vision about me to hinder my progress. You are not seeing right. You need another uh, spectacle. You need glasses. And if I give you the glasses I'm wearing, because I'm wearing a divine spectacle. And I see something you cannot see. I see a champion. I see a Goliath killer. I see a giant killer. That is what I see. What you see will determine what you do in life. And then as Saul said, you cannot. Because all I see is a youth who wants to waste his life and endanger his life. You cannot confront this man. And the man said, it is not what you see about me that matters. It's what I see about myself. You see about me that I cannot. I see I can. You see a coward, I see a champion. And then he said, Saul, let me change your eyesight. Let me change what you see. I'll tell you a story about myself you don't know. I was in the wilderness. And then a bear came to take one of the sheep. I got at him. That bear, I had not seen anybody like me before. Because I am unique. Because I am different. And I have no duplicates. In the land, you have no duplicate. Nobody is exactly like you. Nobody can do what you can do. Nobody can achieve what you will achieve. And so I took on that bear with my bare hand. I tore him into pieces. And then I watched over the sheep and a lion came. You see, a lion, it depends on who you are. And it depends on who you see. If you see a champion in yourself, you will kill that lion. Amen. Your vision either determines whether you are a coward or you are a champion. We may be of the same height. We may know the same English language. We may go to the same school. We may read the same Bible. What you see about yourself will determine whether you have faith in God or you have fear in your circumstance. And eventually, he said, that lion came, I took him, and then I tore him to pieces. And then Saul said, you have changed my vision about you. Now I know you can do it. But then Saul said, for you to do it, let me give you what you will use. What is that? My armor. All right, bring. And then he put it on. And then as he put it on, it was oversized. He said, you are I try to change your vision. You are trying to change my vision. As I look at self at my, in the mirror, I said, this is not the David I knew. This is not the one I saw before I came. Huh, take your armor. I know the one I always use. And then he went to the side of the sea. And then he gathered one, two, three, four, five, and he put it in the bag. And then he came. While he was coming, Goliath had another vision. Goliath said, who is this one coming? 
Goliath, what vision do you see? I see the vision of an inexperienced young boy who is not qualified to be on the battlefield and he comes to fight with me. It is not what they see about you that matters. It's what you see about yourself. <laughs> and so as Goliath was saying, okay, come. Today, I will kill you. Because what I see, you see, if you see wrong, you are going to be defeated. If you see right this afternoon, you are going to succeed. Yeah. And then after everybody said what they saw, it came to the turn of David to say what he saw. He said, I see in myself a champion. Yeah. And he said, you come to me with your son and your son. And I come to you today in the name of the Lord. This very day, because of what I see, I see a giant in me. This very day, I will destroy you. I will give your body to the fowls of the air. And then he took one stone out of five. What is that? Now, now, listen. One out of five. When you write one over five times 100, that is 20. That's 20 percent. I said that is what? 20%. Amen. <laughs> Do you know that people have discovered, they have discovered that the greatest and the highest person that ever achieved anything, they don't use more than 20 percent of their potentials. You don't need 100 percent. You don't need all the five stones. Just 20% of your potential, you will accomplish. Yeah. The Lord has put so much inside you that if you knew what you have and that only 20% will destroy the greatest giant that will ever confront your life, you'll never be sorrowful again in your life. Yeah. And so he brought out one stone out of five. And while Goliath was still seeing a youth, but this young man saw a giant, a champion. He did it like this. You know, our small boys, our sons, how they did it. When they want to kill a bird, when they want to kill a rabbit, and then he sent it like this. The man, he was still seeing wrong. He was looking like this. Until the thing sank into his head. I'm telling you today, you are an overcomer. If I can just come to you today, all I need to change about you is your vision about yourself. And if you have the right vision about yourself, you will accomplish in Jesus' name. Don't ever allow what people see about you to hinder your vision. Whatever they say, they say, let them say Whatever they think about you, let them see. Here comes another man. His name is Paul. He had met the Lord at, in the way going to Damascus. And then he came to Jerusalem. As he came to Jerusalem, he wanted to join the apostles. And then they looked around. They said, there is no space here for any other apostle. All the apostles are completed. No other space for any apostle. How do you think about that? When God raises up an apostle and they see the man, they say, that one is not apostle. That one, that one is not a prophet. That one, that one is not a preacher. That one is a persecutor. And then he wanted to be even just a member. They said, there's no chance. A minister, there's no chance. Why? Because of what they saw. Don't allow what they see to hinder your vision about yourself. I've made up my mind. It is not what you see about me that matters. It's what I see. And I see it in the word of God. That God has raised me up. That God has lifted me up. That I am going to be an achiever. I am going to be more than a conqueror. And I'm going to do what the Lord has called me to do. Because of what I see. And then eventually, Barnabas came and said, Apostles, we're not seeing correctly. This man that you see here, the Lord has met him. It's not the old man that we used to see. It's a new man. And then they said, is that right? They said, all right. They said, come. 
You can be in our midst as a member, not as a minister, because their eyesight was only corrected a little. And then eventually Saul came in. He became the greatest apostle. Yeah. What if we only depended on the vision of the apostles in Jerusalem? They will keep that man under the bench. He will never accomplish anything. Nobody will keep you under. Yeah. You are rising up to the top because of what the Lord sees about you. And even though the others don't see it now, they will see it later. Now, before I go into the other parts of the message, I'm asking you, what seest thou? What do you see about yourself? As the Lord has called you, as the Lord is putting you in place, as the Lord is bringing the anointing upon your life, what seest thou? What you see about yourself will determine what you will achieve in life. And you will achieve something. Amen. I said you will achieve something. Amen. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, a compelling vision. A compelling vision. Number two, a comprehensive vocation. A comprehensive vocation. Number three, a convicting voice. A convicting voice. Let's go to number one. A compelling vision. Let's come to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, the people perish. You see, if you don't have a vision, a vision of yourself, a vision of the missionary field, a vision of the evangelistic field, a vision of the people that are waiting to receive the gospel, a vision of the possibilities and the potentials you have in Christ, a vision of the things you can do in this, your single life. If you don't have any vision, you'll fold your hand. Because you don't have a vision of what you can do, a vision of what you can accomplish, a vision of what you can become. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, all you will see is difficulty. All you will see will be impossibility. All you will see will be a problem. But when there is vision, your problem will be minimized and your power will be maximized. In Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, reading from verse 1. Now Moses catch the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burnt with fire, and the bush was not consumed. What a vision this was! He saw this vision, and this vision turned his life around. The vision you see, the revelation you see, and the things revealed to you from heaven that you behold will change your life and turn everything around. Actually, this vision was given to him to understand. The children of Israel, they were represented by the bush. The persecution, the affliction, the oppression of Egypt that's represented by fire. And the fire was born in the bush. The oppression, the affliction was upon the children of Israel. But they were not consumed. And the Lord was showing him the revelation that that bush, although the fire is burning inside it and around it and on top of it and even beneath it, Persecution everywhere, oppression everywhere, affliction everywhere. Yet, the children of Israel, they were not destroyed, they were not consumed. And then in verse 3, and Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush is not burnt? Why the bush 
is not born. Why? Because naturally, the natural laws is that when you have fire, then it's burning the bush. The bush should be consumed. But sh there is something happening that the bush is not consumed. And you ask the reason why? Very simple. Almighty God was inside that bush. That's why the voice of the Lord called unto him out of the burning bush. It's the presence of the Lord that makes the bush not to be burnt. And no matter what fire may burn around your life, the presence of the Lord in your life will preserve your life. Yeah. Satan has not been able to make that fire that will burn and consume a child of God. And there is no river that can drown a real child of God. And there is no problem that can consume and destroy a real child of God because the presence of God and the power of God and the promise of God all united together in the midst of that burning bush. That's why the bush is not burned. A vision, when you see that vision, a compelling vision, it does something in your life. It tells us, in verse 4, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. It's the presence of the Lord inside that bush that did not allow the bush to be born. Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put up thy shoes from off thy feet. From the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses seed his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore behold the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. It was that vision that marked a turning point in the life and in the career and in the ministry of Moses, this great man of God. It became a compelling vision. And of course, every time as he was going on in his ministerial journey, that he encountered a difficulty, or he encountered a problem, or he encountered a challenge that should have consumed him, he will look back to that vision that he saw. And he will remember, no, this fire cannot consume me because the other fire did not consume Israel and the reason for the lack the, the impossibility of any fire ever consuming the people of God is the presence of the almighty God inside that bush and the Lord said my presence shall go with you I will never leave you I will never forsake you so I may boldly say the Lord is my helper what shall man do unto me? It is that vision that you keep on referring to and you keep on looking at and then that becomes a compelling motivating force in your life to be and to do what you ought to do when looking at Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 18. Acts chapter 18, I'm reading to you from verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, 
lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because they was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought by their occupation. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I go unto the Gentiles. Now the point here is this. Paul the apostle came to Corinth and he began to preach the word of God. He entered into their synagogue and was telling them, This Jesus, the one born in Bethlehem, and the one that lived the life who went about doing good, healing up that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him, and the one that died on the cross of Calvary, the one that was buried on the third day, he rose again. This is the Christ, this is the Savior, and this is our Redeemer. And then the people began to oppose him. And they began to blaspheme him. That's enough to run somebody out of town. If you don't have any vision. That's enough to make a person pack all his load and say, there's no point staying there. They will not accept in Corinth. If the people who are Jewish people, who knew the Old Testament very well, if they are opposing and blaspheming, how about the Gentiles who know nothing about the scriptures of the Old Testament? That's enough to make a person pack his load, his baggage, and run out of town. Because everywhere he went in their synagogues, everybody opposed him, and they blasphemed. It says, they're even committing more sin by my presence with them. Because they are blaspheming the name of the Lord. And they are opposing the truth of the gospel. Come on now. Be sensible, be reasonable, pack your load and run away from town. If you don't have vision, problems will run you out of town. If you don't have vision, people will run you out of town. If you don't have vision, the peculiarities of the time and the peculiarities of the system will run you out of town. That's why, look at this now, I'm reading to you from verse 9. Then the Lord spake to Paul in the night by a vision. The Lord spoke to Paul the apostle in the night by a vision. You see, we need vision. Because that vision is what will compel you to keep on moving on in the midst of the problem. In the midst of the challenges is a vision that the Lord reveals to you of the possibilities available on the mission field, on the evangelistic field, or in the church ministry. It's that vision that will carry you on and compel you to stay where you are and keep on doing the work of the Lord. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace, for I am with thee. And no man shall search on thee to hurt thee. I need a good amen there. Yeah. For I have much people in this city. You will think because those people were blaspheming, nobody will get saved. Because those people were opposing the gospel. And they were contradicting the gospel. And they were acting as if we don't need this kind of message here. You will think nobody will get saved. But Almighty God said in the vision, I have much people in this city. It's the vision you have. It's not the problems of the people that will destroy your ministry. And it is not the, you know, the poverty of the people that will destroy your ministry. And it is not their peculiarities. This place is so peculiar. That's not what to destroy your ministry. It's the lack of vision. The lack of vision. When you have the vision that the Lord himself 
is revealing to you and has given to you. It will show you and reveal to you. I have much people in this city. And then he tells us in Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. This is the overall vision of Paul the Apostle. And it's a vision that turned him around. It's a vision that changed him completely. In Acts chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining around about me. And then we journeyed with me. And when we were all falling to the earth, I had a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to keep against the priests. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet. Stop there for a moment. Here is a man that thought, I'm in the greatest career, the greatest work I will ever do. All these Nazarenes or Nazarites, the people that are following after Jesus, raised up in Nazareth. And they see that this is a savior. He felt his life career was to destroy this kind of religion. It must not stand. And he put all his wage, all his wealth, all his wisdom, he put it behind his fighting against this new religion. And he was sweating at it. And he was traveling all about. And now he was going to Damascus. But a vision changed his destiny. A vision changed his direction. A vision changed his decision. You know, when God gives you this kind of vision, and you have been going a particular direction, and then it comes and it gives you a compelling, irresistible vision in your life, then you are turned around. And the career you thought you will spend the whole of your life on, all that career, the Lord tells you there's no way there. There is no profit there. There is no reward there. And then he brings you back and he says, This is the way. Walk ye therein. That's what happened to Saul. Let's look at it now from verse 16. But rise and stand on thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of the things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee to open their eyes as your eyes have been opened to turn them from darkness to light as you have been turned from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me whereupon O King Agrippa I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision it was a vision it was a vision that turned his life around and when you have a vision the coward will be changed to a champion the fearful will be changed to a fearless, uncompromising man. The undependable will be turned to a trustworthy man. And the persecutor will be turned to a preacher. When you have this vision, the Lord will release you into what you are to do for the future. And from the vision the Lord is giving you today about yourself and about the Lord, this compelling vision in your life will make your ministry to grow and you will succeed in the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. You will succeed. Amen. Nothing will hinder you. Amen. Vision actually does a lot for us. In Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24. I am reading from verse 4. 
Numbers chapter 24, reading from verse 4. He has said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance and having his eyes open. Vision. Balaam said, I keep my eyes open, and yet I see what others do not see. And as you keep your eyes open, and the Lord favors you, and reveals to you and shows you what others do not see, then your life will add value. Your life will have greater treasure. Your life will have greater worth. In verse 5, how goodly are thy tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacles, O Israel, as the valleys are they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, and as the trees of lying aloes, which the Lord has planted, and as cedar, cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour water out of his buckets. And his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag. And his kingdom shall be exalted. I thought you'll say, Amen. Amen. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He has a seed to one the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations his enemies. And shall break their bones and pierce them through with his arrows. He couched, he lay down as a great lion who shall stir him up. Blessed is he that blesseth thee, and cursed is he that curseth thee. Here was Balaam, and he was seeing some vision. It was this kind of vision that made him to know the importance and the worth of the children of Israel. In verse 16, he has said, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, but having his eyes open, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not near. There shall come a star out of Jacob and a scepter that rise out of Israel and shall destroy the children of Seth, and shall smite the corners of Moab. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies. And Israel shall do valiantly. And Israel shall do valiantly. Yeah. That's the vision. That's the revelation. When you have the vision that no matter the Amalekites might confront us, and the Canaanites might stand in our way. But we have the vision already. We have the revelation already that the people of God shall do valiantly. Nothing will stop our progress. Amen. Out of Jacob, verse 19, shall come he that shall have dominion. And with Christ, we're going to have dominion together. Amen. Again, it depends on what you see. If you're looking at the wrong side, you see only problem. You see only defeat. And you see only downfall. But when you look on the right side of the majesty on high, you will see already Christ is having dominion. And we are going to have dominion with Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. And shall destroy him that remaineth out of the city. I'm turning to Second Corinthians chapter 12. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I read to you one of the visions and revelations of Paul the Apostle. But Paul said, that's not the only vision I had. I have all the visions and other revelations. No wonder that man just went on and on and on and nothing could stop him. And he said, if I were to glory, if I were to manifest pride, if I were to feel haughty, I will come to the telling and the revealing of revelations and visions. 
But he wasn't going to be proud. He said in verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether in the, out of the body I cannot tell God, knowing such an one cut up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, he was talking about himself, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth how that he was cut up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter of such and one i will glory yet of myself i will not glory but in my infirmities for though i would desire to glory i shall not be a fool for i will say the truth but now i forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be or that he heareth of me and lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a son in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this sin, for the son in the flesh, I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for thee. My grace is sufficient for thee. Amen. You see, when the Lord has given you revelation, you must not be lifted up. You must not be proud. But you must allow that revelation, that vision to move you on in the ministry the Lord has called you to. He said, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then, 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 then am I strong. The vision strengthens you. And the vision makes you to be a man of action. I come to point number two. A comprehensive vocation. A comprehensive vocation. You see, when the Lord gives you a vision, the vision leads you to a vocation. The vision also determines your values. You see, the vision you have makes you to know what is valuable, what is worthwhile, what is important. And then a man of vision will not be a man of uh, non-essential. You see, there are people, they occupy their time, they occupy their lives with non-essentials, unimportant things, non-issues. Those are not people with vision. When you have a vision, then all your activities are narrowed down to what is important, what is indispensable, and what is essential, what is of great consequence. Vision leads to a vocation. And vision also determines your value. Number three, vision compels vigilance. You are watching over that vision. This vision that I have, I will not allow anything to take the vision out of my hand. Vision compels vigilance. Number, number four, vision produces vigor. Vision produces vigor, vitality, strength, power, courage. You see, a man of vision, he knows I am made for something. I am raised up for something. And because of what he has seen, and because of what he knows, that produces vigor, vitality, and courage and strength. Number five, vision encourages virtue. Virtue. It says people like us, having vision, there are things we don't get involved in. For example, the life of Joseph. Joseph was a dreamer. A dreamer is a man of vision. The Lord had shown him where he will be and what he will do and what he will become. And then Potiphar's wife said, come and sing with me. And the young man said, you don't know you are talking to people like us. Don't do that kind of thing. People like us, we are destined for the throne. 
and we're destined for the mountain top. And we never descend, we never get low and degrade ourselves and disgrace ourselves and come to the valley with people like you. You don't know who you are talking to. People of vision are people of virtue. You keep your righteousness, you keep your purity, and you keep your virtue because you are a man of vision. Number six, vision creates ventures. Ventures. By ventures, I mean risks. You take risks. Have you ever seen something like this before? No risk, no reward. No risk, no riches. No risk, no resources. You see, if you just sit down and you say, I can't go out there. It is risky. You will not have reward. You will not have riches. You will not have resources. Resources will not be chasing after you and running after you and looking for you. It's a man that takes risk. A man that says, yes, I know they say there's danger there, but I've seen a vision. And my vision is compelling me. My vision is propelling me. Vision will lead to ventures. The ventures will tell you there is risk. Yes, I know. But if you don't take the risk, there will be no reward. There will be no riches. There will be no resources. Therefore, because I'm an vision, that's why you take the risk and you jump out and you go out and you move on and you do what you are called to do. Number seven, vision leads to victory. And we're going to be victorious. Amen. I said we're going to be victorious. Amen. Let's look at this in Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34. I'm reading from verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 34. Verse 10. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land and in all that mighty hand and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. As I look at Moses and I told you that this time we're looking at a comprehensive vocation. Have you seen the comprehensive work vocation that he, that he was involved in? As we look at Moses, number one, to even pick a man at the age of 80. To start a ministry. At the age of 80, to begin something he had not done all these 80 years. You see, whether you are old or young, you can have vision. And the vision is what determines what you accomplish. It's not how young you are. It's not how old you are. If you don't have vision, you may just be 28 and you'll be walking and moving like a man of 60. But if you have vision, you can be 70 years of age and you'll be walking and you're energetic like a man of 23. When you have vision, it is vision that gives you energy. It is vision that gives you enthusiasm. It is vision that gives you the thrust into life. And you say, even though you are 70 now, yet there is still something to accomplish. And as you look at Moses at the age of 80, you see, it is not old age that kills people generally. It is not old age that kills the enthusiasm and their energy and their power and their thrust into life and achievement in life. It is the lack of vision that kills people and kills their imagination and kills their enthusiasm and kills every strength within them. And then they will say, I am already 60. What can I do? I'm already 70. Let the younger generation take up whatever they want to take up at my age. What do you think I can do? Because you have no vision. Now, at the age of 80, the Lord called this man Moses. And then he had comprehensive vocation. What do I mean by that? Number one, he was a deliverer. He delivered the children of Israel. That's even enough for anybody to do. To go into a land and then deliver not 10 people, not 100 people, not 1,000 people. To deliver 
three million people. That's enough. But that was not enough for Moses. Number two, he was a prophet. That's why it is said that there was not a prophet since in Israel. Like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Number one, he was a deliverer. Number two, he was a prophet. Number three, he was a teacher. He taught them, you know, those people were slaves. They had been slaves for four, about 400 years in the land of Egypt. And even though they were slaves, they knew nothing about the word of God. Then he taught them. He taught them the word of the Lord, the mind of the Lord, the law of God. Number four, he was the lawgiver. The lawgiver. He went to the Lord and he got the law. And he got that law from the hand of the Almighty God and gave it to the land of Israel. Do you understand that the civilized world today, the constitution is based on that moral law that Moses got. And it doesn't matter what country it is, that thou shalt not kill. It originated from this law of Moses. You will not steal. There's a penalty in every country for anybody who steals, whether it's a Christian nation or it's a secular nation or it is another religious nation. There's a penalty. And then when it says you'll not, you'll not be a false witness against your neighbor, it, it's like that everywhere. And now, it was because Moses yielded himself to the Lord. He was a deliverer. He was a prophet. He was a teacher. He was a lawgiver. Number five, you are counting. Thank you very much. He was a leader. He was a leader. He was a great, great leader. And when he went in front of those children of Israel, and they confronted the Red Sea, and they were crying. He said, don't worry. I'm in front here. And I know what you do. And he prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said, stretch out your rod. And then the river Red Sea was divided into two. And they went on. That was a great, mighty leader. He created a path out of where there was no, where there was no way. And then, number six, he was a writer. He was a writer. Do you see Genesis? He wrote it. And Exodus, he wrote it. A writer. Leviticus, he wrote it. And see all the details there. And you see what that man wrote. In theological seminaries and universities right now, in the Department of Religion, they are still studying that thing, and they are getting a doctorate degree. And they are doing research on the things that he wrote. Because he was a writer, a comprehensive vocation. And then, number seven, he was a trainer. That's how he trained Joshua to be a mighty warrior. That's how he trained Joshua to be a successor. The person that will take over from him. A trainer. A comprehensive vocation because of a compelling vision. I come to Jeremiah chapter 1. In Jeremiah chapter 1, we're reading from verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 1, we're looking at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying... Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. And the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go. To all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I put my words in thy mouth. Now the comprehensive vocation, that is, all the things that Jeremiah was called to do. Verse 10. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms. Number one, to root out. Everything the heavenly father had not planted, Jeremiah was called of God. Appointed of God. Anointed by God. Sent by God to root out. Number two, to pull down. The weapons of our warfare, an arch canal, but they're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. That was another ministry that he had. 
and to destroy. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Number four, and to throw down. Number five, and to build on this rock, I build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Number six, and to plant. See, the comprehensive vocation and the comprehensive elaborate ministry that the Lord had called Jeremiah to. And then I come to 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 7. 1 Timothy chapter 2. We're reading verse 7. Where unto I am ordained a preacher, one, and an apostle, two, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, and a teacher, number three, of the Gentiles in faith and verity. You see, when you have a vision from the Lord, a compelling vision leads you to a comprehensive vocation. A preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 11, the same Paul the apostle, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. The same Paul in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when ye reach, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ by the gospel whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I shall preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has not been has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. As to summarize everything concerning Paul, a comprehensive vocation, what did he do? And what was he? Number one, he was an apostle. Number two, he was a prophet. Number three, he was an evangelist missionary. Number four, he was a pastor. Number five, he was a teacher. Number six, he was a writer. Look at all these epistles that he wrote. Number seven, he was a leader trainer. He trained others and he trained them as a leader. And you see then, when the Lord calls you and there is comprehensive, comprehensive vocation coming out of the competitive vision in your life, there's another thing he does for you now. You have a convicting voice. Point number three, a convicting voice. You see, when the Lord has given you a vision, and then he gives you that comprehensive vocation, you need a voice. You need some authority. You need some power. You need some assurance and confidence to go out and say what he has put in your mouth to say. A convicting voice. Let me illustrate that to you. How conviction comes through the voice of God's anointed. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, for Samuel chapter 24, reading from verse 16. For Samuel 24, verse 16, and it came to pass 
when David had made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and he wept. The voice of David brought conviction in Saul. And David said, and, and he said unto David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. You see, this man, David, the young man, he had conviction in his voice. And the king even cried out and wept, because he was under conviction as a result of what David had done and what David had said in chapter 26. For Samuel chapter 26, verse 17. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my Lord, O king. And then we read in verse 21. Then said Saul, I have sinned. Return, my son David. I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool, I have erred exceedingly. The man was under conviction because of the voice of David. And when you are a man of vision and a man of vocation, you'll be a man of a convicting voice. We come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. Acts chapter 2 verse 14. And Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Lifted up his voice. And what a kind of voice this is. Because now the Holy Ghost was upon him. And the fire of the Holy Ghost that came upon him affected his authority. Affected his courage. Affected his character. He lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken unto my words. By the time he finished, what happened to them? Verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were preached in their heart, and they said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were under conviction. And then he told them, in verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, removal, cleansing, forgiveness of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's conviction. And you know what brought the conviction here? The power of the Holy Ghost in the life of Peter, the apostle. The power of the Holy Ghost that brought fire into his world. The power of the Holy Ghost that brought pungency into his world. And then they were pierced in their heart. And they had pungency that came upon them. And then they said, men and brethren, we have heard the word. And we are convicted of our sins. What shall we do? And then he said, there's something for you to do. To have the salvation of the Lord. To have the forgiveness of the Lord. Repent. Turn away from your sin. You mean go in the wrong direction. Turn around. And now go in the right direction. And you will have the forgiveness of the Lord. And you will have the cleansing of your heart. And you will have the gift and the power. The unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon you. Because the promise is unto you. And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Actually, that has been the promise of the Lord for us. That 
will receive the Holy Ghost and then we will speak with the wisdom of the Spirit of God. And today, it will come upon your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Thank you very much. I just wanted you to convince me you are not sleeping. In Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We're looking at verse 19 and verse 20. But when they deliver you up, and take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given unto you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaketh in you. It is not you who is speaking, but the Spirit of your Father who is speaking in you. In Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12, the Spirit of God speaking in us and through us. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. The word of the Spirit will come through you and bring conviction upon the people. Luke chapter 21, verses 14 and 15. Luke 21, verse 14. Settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom. I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. Again, all that you find in the anointing and the unction and the power and the baptism and immersion in the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. John chapter 16. I'm reading from verse 7. Nevertheless, I say the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more of judgment, because... The prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come? He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. When the Spirit of God comes upon your life, you are saved to start with, then you are sanctified, made holy, made pure, purified by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Then you are immersed in the Holy Spirit, in the fire and the power and dynamite of the Holy Ghost. Then it brings this conviction through your word that when you are speaking, when you are preaching, conviction comes upon the people. And then they know that the Lord has sent you unto them. That power he will give unto us. Amen. That conviction he will give unto us. Amen. And through your word and through my word and through our word, many people will be turned unto the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. John chapter 14 verse 26. John 14 verse 26. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. You know, there are many times you have read something, you have heard something, or you have learned something, and you have forgotten. But it says the Holy Spirit, the resident presence and power of the Lord in your life, the one that comes to take over your life, to inspire you, and to instruct you, and to lead you on to be a success in ministry. 
that that power of the Holy Ghost, the dynamite within you, that he is the one that will bring to your remembrance everything you have ever heard, everything you have ever learned. And then he will teach you new things you have not known. And when you speak, you speak in the power of the Holy Ghost. And you speak in the fire, in the anointing, in the pungent, piercing, convicting words of the Spirit. That's why it says there that he will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, there are three things that come together to give you a convicting voice. Number one is your character. Number two is your conviction. Number three is your courage. Character, conviction, courage, all combined together to give authority and power to our voice. If you have conviction, and you have character, and you don't have courage, you'll stand up, and when you speak, you'll not speak convincingly. There will be no convic convicting power in your voice. If you have courage, and you have character, but you don't have conviction, You'll be like jellyfish. You don't have a backbone. Yet, there will not be the convicting power and authority and fire in your word when you speak. And if you have conviction and you have character, but you don't have courage, you'll be trembling. And there will be no conviction either. You need all the three in place. The conviction, the character, and the courage all to combine together and then you are going to have a convicting voice today the lord has revealed to us the importance of a compelling vision that leads us to a comprehensive vocation that then gets us to stand up and with convicting voice we declare the word of the lord and the lord will do it for you i said the lord will do it for you will rise up now you will say oh lord i need this vision reveal yourself to me reveal yourself to me and the lord will do it you will pray as if you are not tired you will pray as if you are not weak you will pray as if you want a vision from the lord a compelling vision from the lord and you are telling the lord oh lord here i am today i need a compelling vision a vision that will compel me and propel me into the ministry so that I will not be tired, I will not be weak. Oh Lord, give me today a vision of yourself, a new vision of Calvary, a new vision of the ministry. What you want me to accomplish today? A compelling vision. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. He revealed himself to Moses. He revealed himself to Joshua. He revealed himself to David. He revealed himself to Paul the Apostle. He revealed himself to Peter. He took them to the Mount of Transfiguration and he revealed to them something they never forgot on that Mount of Transfiguration. Oh Lord, reveal yourself to me. Oh Lord, reveal yourself to me. A compelling vision. And then you will be able to say, O oh, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision. Reveal more of yourself to me. Reveal more of your power to me. Reveal more of your truth to me. Reveal to me what you want me to accomplish in life. A new revelation. A compelling vision. O oh, Lord, here am I compelling vision compelling vision compelling vision let the Lord do it and then you will run you will not be weary and you will walk and you will not fade let him reveal himself more to you today let him reveal himself more to you today compelling vision compelling vision that kind of vision that will lead you into a vocation the kind of vision 
that will raise up your worth and your value. The kind of vision that will make you more vigilant. The kind of vision that will shape the destiny of many people. The kind of vision that compels a decision in your life. Vision. Let him accomplish it in your life. Vigor will give you vitality and strength. Will encourage and uplift virtue, character, purity, holiness, righteousness in your life. A vision that will lead into ventures. No risks, no rewards. No risk, no riches. No risk, no resources. What is your vision? Before you can accomplish much for God, there must be a vision to focus on. There must be a goal to pursue. There must be a project to start. There must be a challenge to overcome. A dream to realize. You tell the Lord, I'll be a man of vision. I will be a woman of vision. Do you have a vision? Do you have a mission? Do you have a goal? Do you have a plan? Do you have any project you want to start? Do you have any challenge? Do you have any dream? You will not be idle if you have a vision. You will not be tired if you have a vision. You will not remain discouraged if you have a vision. You will not allow a problem to tie you down if you have a vision. Let the Lord open your eyes and see. What do you see about yourself? What do you see about yourself? What do you see about yourself? Do you see a champion coming out of you? Do you see a mighty conqueror coming out of you? Do you see an unconquerable warrior coming out of you? What do you see? See yourself in the light of God's revelation. You'll never be the same again. You will never be the same again when you have a compelling vision, a comprehensive vocation,